Hey everyone, welcome to Ask Me Monday number 27. I'm Vicki Howell. Good to see you on Monday. We had, it's the first day of spring, but we had like this cold snap here in Austin. So it's been like 90 degrees here before today, and then it's like in the 30s this morning. So a little chilly. Um, so hi. It's also our first day back to school and back to normal life post spring break and post like the South by Southwest craziness that overtakes my city. Um, so we are moving a little slowly, um, but we are here and happy to be here. When I say we, I mean me. I don't mean all of my personalities. I meant we, my family was, I'm going to just stop talking. <laughs> all right. I'm going to go straight to questions. Um, I did answer a few on the boards already. Um, I might repeat some of them here, but uh, if I don't answer you here, I will try to answer you on the boards uh, via text. So let's start with um, Angela wants to know what my go-to heel for socks um, is. And I, gen I like um, a little bit of a reinforced heel. So I generally do um, a slip one, knit one on the right side all the way on the right, and then I'll purl on the back. Um, and um, I find that that gives it a really nice kind of like thick, squishy heel. Um, Christina wants to know if I have any favorite crochet or knitting magazines. So I do, definitely. Um, I've been writing for Knit Simple for like, I don't know, like four or five years. So I'm a big fan of theirs. Vogue Knitting, of course, beautiful. Um, I, I like, I'm a total like fresh like kid at heart, so I really like kind of the younger slanting magazines a lot, like Knit Scene and Crochet Scene. Uh, those are super great. I love Molly Makes, even though that's not necessarily, you know, a knitting or crochet mag magazine per se. They often have knit and crochet projects in there. Um, I just got a new magazine um, that's adorable called Pom Pom Quarterly, and it's actually a UK publication, but... Um, they moved to, one of the publishers moved to, um, it's got super mo modern, cool, moved to Austin, I found out, which is where I live. I don't know, it's just, it's really simple, um, but beautiful and cool, and it's, it's put out quarterly, so it kind of has more of like a book feel. It's really nice. Um, I think you can get that at specialty shops or whatever. So uh, they were nice enough to gift me a copy. So that's been really beautiful to look at. Um, so, okay, let's keep going. Um, Birdie wants to know, she says she's been knitting for five years and she's starting to teach herself how to use double pointed needles. And she wants to know if metal or bamboo are better. So I think when you get started at least, um, I would suggest bamboo. I actually use bamboo all the time. I work with clover needles and they have these awesome like Takumi bamboo ones. So I use them all the time. But in general, I would say bamboo at first too because there's a little bit of grab from the from the bamboo. So it's not going to be as slippery with your fibers, with your yarn going off of it. Sometimes it can be, it can take a little while to get used to, you know, keeping your yarn, your stitches live on all of these needles at once. So if you also have a little bit of grab on your side, you'll probably be more successful, feel better about your double pointed knitting, and then we all win. Yay. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Gina asked if I have a favorite dishcloth pattern. I posted, um, I posted one that I did for several years back for, um, when I used to write a column for PBS Parents called Craft a Parent. And I like it because it's really simple, but it has, um, a few rows of baubles every now and then. So it looks simple, but it has, um, some like gushiness for which is great for scrubbing or even just exfoliating and I love gifting it with like a nice like homemade not necessarily made by bee but homemade by someone's soap um, I think it's a really nice hostess gift um, and it's a really great opportunity to use some organic cottons or something that's a little more expensive because you don't need a ton of yardage but you can really make a nice like solid you know housewarming warming or host gift with that so I posted that in the notes from um from my post yesterday, not in the notes, you know, I may repost it. Um, Marlene wanted to know um, how, if I would demo Kitchener Stitch, I also posted a link to a Knitting Daily TV segment I did on Kitchener Stitch. Um, so that has also been posted. Um, let's see. 
think that's most of the ones that I can answer. Oh, G uh, Gianna wants to know if I have a YouTube video teaching knitting or crochet. Um, I have play, yes, I have a YouTube channel. It's just youtube.com slash Vicki Howell. And I have playlists for both getting schooled crochet and getting school schooled knitting. I'm slowly updating those to get past the basics. Eventually they'll go more intermediate, but um, there's full playlists that are there to get you started. If you would like something more intensive though, where I take you all the way to like an advanced beginner, um, I would suggest checking out my Creative Live classes. That's just creativelive.com slash Vicki Howell. And if you use the code Vicki25, so Vicki and the number 25, all caps, then you'll get 25% off the classes um, through the end of May. So check out that. I have about, I have four knitting and crochet classes um, up there now, and then in April I'm shooting five more, so, um, so check those out for sure. Um, Johnson wants to know how to figure out a swatch for a crochet project. I think that um, this person just wanted to know what size of a swatch to make. The standard swatch size is four inches or ten centimeters wide and um, tall. Just a general one, you could do more. Um, I wouldn't do too much less if you want to get an accurate gauge, but about that four inches. Um, let's see here. Let me scroll through these before I start a little demo that I wanted to do. <laughs> Christine said it would be great if I could do it one more a week. Girl, I'm barely hanging on doing one a week. I appreciate it. <laughs> but, um, but I love it. Thank you for the support. I really appreciate it. Um, a lot of support for the bamboo needle comment. That's cool. Um, So Priscilla wants to know, she says she can't use double pointed needles, but for tiny things, um, what should she use? You might look into the um, magic loop method um, with circulars. You need a 32 inch circular needle, and there's a bunch of videos you could just Google. Maybe I'll do a demo in weeks to come, but if you want an answer now, um, Priscilla, go ahead and just Google um, magic loop method. and It'll show you how you can use a really long circular needle when you're knitting in the round for small, um, for small diameters um, or circumference, I guess. Um, it really all it is is it's just a method of pulling out the cord so you're only using what you need. Um, but that that's a workaround if you really don't feel comfortable uh, using double pointed needles. But I highly suggest that you practice with them because they're really double pointed needles are really actually great. And if you can just get past the fact that you have four, you know four to five needles at a time and just realize you're only working with two at a time, I think that you'll probably find your groove. All right, um, so a couple of times, I don't know if this is the same person that's been asking or um, if I've had more than one person ask, but um, Jenny has asked for a ruching demo, um, either more than once or else somebody else has asked. Um, so I would like to show that, um, I'd like to give you a little demo and then I'll come back and I have just a couple more sort of updates and check-ins for you. So close my laptop, get that out of the way, and I'm going to do the uh, the always not very graceful readjusting of my small table and turn around so that you can, you'll be able to see. So if you'll give me just a few seconds, that would be awesome. And I'm going to teach you how to ruche, and I'll also explain what, what the heck ruching means for those of you that um, maybe aren't familiar with the term. All right, I'm flipping over. Let's do this. Okay, so I have fabric out first because I wanted to show you, um, I wanted to demonstrate what ruching looks like. So for those of you that don't know, I'm actually going to pick up the camera so you can see it a little bit better. So here's a piece of fabric. So, ruching is much like gathering. So, gathering would be if you took away fabric at the top by pinching it together so that the rest draped, right? That's gathering. All right, now I need my other hand, so I'm going to put down the camera. The difference is in um, what ruching is, is that you would also gather. I got to move so my hand's not in the way. You would gather on the bottom too, so that you have more fabric 
and um, gathering in the center. You probably have seen this um, on bathing suits. It's really common to, it's a really great like cheat to cover up a little bit of extra tummy or whatever. If you have kind of a spandex ruching this way, you may have seen it in dresses as well. Sometimes it's just a little design detail on sleeves. Um, for knitting, um, you could probably use it in the, in the same way, but really it's probably a little bit more decorative. So I'm gonna show you, um, there's more than one method. Um, I've actually before, and I can't, years ago I did, I designed an ascot where I, t I combined both lace weight, I cast on with sport weight yarn with like, let's say size six needles, and then I use, I'm gonna get some more light here, I used size six needles and then I, I worked a few rows and then I swapped to a lace weight yarn and size three needles and worked them and then alternated them. So you got that ruching effect just because the gauge was different. If you don't wanna mess with gauge though, what you need to do is you need to decrease and increase fabric. So I'm gonna show you, this is called garter and stockinette ruching. So this is just one, one type that you could use. Really like more light for you. Um, so I've already worked these garter stitch rows here. So what I need to do is I have 20 stitches on here. I need to double those, so make it 40 stitches so that um, I can get the extra fabric that I need for the ruching. So to do that, since I'm working in garter stitch right here, the most seamless looking increase to do would be a KFB, which is knit in the front and the back of the stitch. So knit in the front, leave that stitch on the left hand needle, and then knit in the back. And now you've made two stitches out of one. And then you're gonna do that in every stitch all the way across. So this is basically, this is like extreme increases. It's like an X game sport for increasing. So you're going to just keep knitting in the front and the back all the way across. Okay, and so you would just continue all the way across until you had double up the amount. So then from there you would purl on the way back and because you're gonna to move to stockinette stitch. And then you're gonna work several rows in stockinette. And you can see how this, let me see if I can get you some more light. That's a little better. Okay, so you can see how this fabric is kind of gathering. And that's because there's, there's double the amount of stitches here, so double the amount of fabric is created. And so now you have that effect. So now though, this is really just the gathering effect. To make it ruching, we need to go back to that original amount. So from here, after you'd worked the rows, and you need to create enough fabric that, so that it, it will have room to ruche. So make sure that you work several rows, probably you know upwards of 10 to 12. And then the next row, you would, extremely, you would extreme decrease. So knit two together all the way across. So you're gonna do that. So you're going back to the 20 stitches from the 40 to 20. So if, let's say you wanted ruching, but you didn't want, um, you didn't want to work in garter stitch. You didn't like the striped look of that. Uh, you could do the exact same thing, only instead of doing the knit front and back increase, I would actually do the make one increase. Um, and that just to refresh your memory would be, you lift this little loop right here from the row below, put it on your needle, and then you'd knit it as if it were its own stitch. And you would do that all the way across. Um, I'm decreasing, not increasing, so I won't do it here. And then that would give you a relatively um, invisible increase comparatively. And so then, and then you could do the same knit two together all the way across. So I won't make you watch the entire row, but you can see like that it's slowly kind of cinching it together. And that's really all there is to it. Um, it's it's a simple, um, it really gives a nice like, you know, 
design detail. I think it would be really sweet on a little girl's skirt or something. Um, it might be a really cute pocket detail too. I don't know, play with it, have fun with it, um, and see where it goes. All right, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about we're, we're three weeks away from the launch of Craftish, my podcast. So I already have eight, eight or nine of them recorded already. I'm really excited. This week I got, or this past week, I got to talk to Tula Pink. If you've never seen her quilts, they're phenomenal. She did this like crazy Marie Antoinette quilt with like the ship and her hair. It was phenomenal. Um, she also has this Elizabeth um, from Queen Elizabeth fabric line. Just absolutely, you should check her out. It's really cool. I talked to Lisa Schaefer from Zelma Rose. She's a fine artist um, with, who specializes in needle arts. So um, it was really cool to talk to her, you know, from a fine arts perspective, um, working with um, with yarn and needles. Um, she does a lot of great jewelry at her website, Zelma Rose. So we'll be talking to her. You'll be hearing that interview soon. Um, I also interviewed... Um, Tamara Kelly from Moogly for those crocheters out there. Um, that was interesting too. So I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. If you know anybody that would be interested in sponsoring one of the episodes of the podcast, please send them my way. You can, they can email info, I-N-F-O, at vickihowell.com, and I can send them a one sheet for sponsorship um, information. That would be awesome if you would do that. Uh, tomorrow I have a... Clover, or I'm sorry, Wednesday, I'll be doing another one of my Clover posts, blog posts, and I'm supposed to be working with that oval loom, which between you and I is still in the box, so I better get cracking. Um, so keep your eyes open for that on Wednesday. Um, I think I've covered everything. Oh, I wanted to stop and say something really quickly. Um, a woman named Maxine Leonard posted on my page, and I was just so touched by it, and I just... I don't know. I think that it's really important that we in our community um, give each other props when we can. And Maxine talked about how she has gotten her knitting groove back after being a victim of violence. After being shot, she lost an arm. She lost her entire arm um, after being shot, and she has retaught herself how to knit. And she joins on my Facebook page and is part of this community that you're all a part of right now. And I just wish that you would just send out, like, send send her out some, like, some love and some positive vibes. Again, her name is Maxine Leonard because um, you're amazing, Maxine. And thank you for sharing that with us and, and for, you know, reminding us, um, giving us a little bit of, um, I don't know, just something to pause on and think of about, about how strong we really are and what we really can bounce back from. Um, you're really inspiring. So thanks for sharing that. So um, that's all I have for you today. Thank you for joining me. If you have any um, other questions, just post them. Again, don't forget to subscribe to Craftish on iTunes or Stitcher or Android, wherever you listen to your podcasts at. Check out my YouTube channel as usual. That's youtube.com slash Vicki Howell. Um, if you want any more projects or inspiration, you can always go to VickiHowell.com. And, um, oh, one last thing. I'm thinking about doing another Instagram um, photo a day challenge. It was really awesome doing it in November, but I would like it to be more inclusive than last time. So I'm, last time it was offered in English and somebody picked it up um, in French. I'm thinking about putting it out there in as many languages as I have help for. So if you know anybody that would be willing to translate a photo a day prompt, which is just going to be 30 days, 30 days has September, April, June, and November. I, however many days are in April um, of my prompts into whatever language. Um, I'll reapproach the same woman about French, but I'd love it in Spanish. Um, I have a friend who could probably do it in Farsi, but um, I know that we have some people from Hungary that are listening. I know that we have some people, you know, from Finland. If there's anybody else that would like to participate in that so that we can be as inclusive as possible just for inspiring each other on Instagram through pictures for a day, please have them um, get in touch with me. They can just post right here um, or they can email info at vickihowell.com. All right, everyone, that's all I've got for today. Please have a great rest of the week and take time to be creative. Bye.